Hello, welcome back to the afternoon of day one at the Kiel Munition Clearance Week. My name is Terry Martin. We met this morning. Uh, some of you may be just joining us now for this afternoon. Some of you may just be dialing in online. It's great to have all of you with us. We're about to, uh, well, I'll just quickly recap what we did this morning and tell you what's, what's ahead with this session. Uh, we, this morning, we got some international perspectives on our topic. Uh, we got input from the United States, from the EU. We gained insights out of, into the state of research in Germany, the Netherlands, and NATO. And now we're going to look a little more closely at environmental and societal impacts. In other words, we're going to zero in on the question why unexploded ordnance and chemical weapons in the sea are a problem. Why are they a problem? Exactly why? What risks do they pose for marine life, for the ecosystem in general, and of course for us humans? Uh, do they threaten food security? What risks do they pose for coastal communities? And we'll be looking at both current and potential impacts on the horizon, which should help us identify where action is urgently needed. Uh, just a little bit to the structure of, of this session. We've got 90 minutes, just like the session we had this morning on the state of science. We'll, I'll introduce our, our four panelists. Uh, we have three with us here, one joining us uh, remotely. They will each then give a 10-minute presentation, and we'll have 45 minutes uh, for questions and answers after their presentations. So be thinking about what questions you might want to put to our panelists uh, for, for this 45 minute question time, which is very generous. We'll be trying to integrate questions. Okay. See, that was unexploded munition. Just, it's now exploded. That was the Kila Bucht, I hope not. Okay, um, no, but we'll have questions coming both from within the room here and hopefully from some of our our, uh, our online followers. So, without further ado, I'll begin with, uh, we have Doc with us sitting, I'll go from this side to the other and end up on the screen with our fourth panelist, uh, Dr. Aaron J. Beck. He's a senior scientist with uh, Geoma Helmholtz. We've already seen a center, a picture for him this morning on his research boat. He was just telling me about that. He's with the uh, Geoma Helmholtz Center for Ocean research, research here in Kiel. He's a marine biogeochemist, and his uh, munitions-related research focuses on environmental release and what impacts, what happens to explosive compounds in, in coastal marine systems. Uh, next to him, Dr. Anita Kunitzer is a senior scientific advisor with the German Environment Agency. She's a marine biologist and has been working on protection of the marine environment for 30 years. She's worked extensively with the European Environment Agency and has led the European Topic Center on Inland Coastal and Marine Environment for 12 years. Third uh, in the row here, Dr. Jürgen Schazak. Uh, he's department head with the Tunin Institute, with another name you've heard this morning already a couple of times. Uh, that's Germany's Federal Research Institute for Rural Areas, Forestry, and Fisheries. Uh, he's a biologist focusing on the effects of environmental variation on uh, fish health. He's been focusing very closely on fish, investigating the effects of marine dumped munition on fish as a fundamental part of the marine ecosystem. And finally, uh, there we are, wonderful. Uh, Dr. Dupuy, I hope you can hear us. Uh, this is Dr. Kendra Dupuy. Uh, she's joining us remotely, as you can see. She's a senior advisor on environment at the Norwegian People's Aid. That's a humanitarian solidarity organization, as they describe themselves. She works in the Department for Mine Action and Disarmament, and her focus is improving environmental safeguarding in actions involving mines. So. Let's hop to it. Each of you has 10 minutes. If you go over a tiny bit, that's okay, but we're going to try to keep it uh, on track very much, and we begin with Aaron Beck. I forgot to ask, how do we... Uh... It seems self-explanatory. So, good afternoon. So I'm going to be speaking about um, underwater munitions as a source of chemical contaminants to the marine environment. Um, <clears throat> This is a map I think we're all familiar with and have seen in different forms, um, but it just kind of illustrates the global nature of the problem. So uh, coastlines worldwide are contaminated with, uh, with munitions. Um, in this case, we're talking about... Um, 
there's a weird message here that I don't know what it means. But um, we're talking about chemical warfare agents um, as well as explosive compounds. Um, and both of those classes of compounds are toxic to one degree or another. Um, chemical warfare agents tend to be more toxic, um, but explosives um, represent the sort of greater bulk of the material um, that's present in dump munitions. So that's sort of one of the things that I'll, I'll focus more on. Um, this is what uh, dump munitions look like in the Baltic Sea. So you've already seen some of these images. Um, but the munitions that are present in the, in the Baltic Sea and in other seas worldwide um, are in a, a range of conditions. So uh, from quite good condition to fully deteriorated. And here you can see a couple of instances where the explosive fill in the munitions is actually exposed to seawater where it can dissolve and the, the chemical compounds can be um, uh, emitted into the environment. Does that work? Good. Um, so from a, from a chemical point of view, uh, the problem of sea dump munitions is not dissimilar from other sea dumped toxic chemicals. Um, so here you see a picture of uh, radioactive waste dumping in the Northeast Atlantic. Um, and these pictures look identical to, to some of the pictures that we've seen for dumping of munitions um, after the Second World War. Um, and the same is true for industrial chemicals which were dumped. In this case, you see a, a picture of a uh, a drum of CFCs that was dumped off the coast of California. Um, one big difference is that for many of the, the other chemicals that were dumped in the ocean, um, there have actually been monitoring programs to monitor the release of these chemicals from those sea dumped objects into the environment. Um, so this is a, um, a quote from a paper from 1992. Um, which says that these uh, radioactive compounds in the vicinity of these uh, radioactive waste dump sites um, have been monitored on a yearly basis, um, and so far samples of water, sediment, and biota um, have not shown any excess in the levels of radionuclides. Um, and then you also see a graph which compares the, the levels of radioactivity at a control site with those at the dump site over two decades. So two decades of monitoring at these dump sites. And that's not the case uh, for uh, dump munitions. So there have been no real long-term programs to try and monitor the release of, of chemical compounds coming out of these dump sites. Um, there have been a number of studies which have, uh, that have looked at chemical release, both from, from chemical munition dump sites as well as conventional munition dump sites. Um, and by and large, there have been sporadic measurements of chemical release from these dump sites. But in general, there's been no... Um, consistent and large-scale release observed at these sites. And in fact, at the, uh, this major dump site at Kobega Haida, um, not far from here, um, there was a study about 15 years ago that led to a press release where they essentially said, uh, we can't measure anything, there's nothing coming off, there's no need for concern. So, we came into the this field uh, about five or six years ago with the perspective of chemical oceanographers. Um, and so our first task was really to try and develop uh, a new method for measuring explosive compounds in seawater at very low levels. Um, so here you can see the, the method that we developed. We have a very fancy mass spectrometer that's very sensitive, which is fantastic. So now we can actually measure really low concentrations of these compounds. Um, and in the map on the bottom shows uh, a map of the, the southwest Baltic Sea. Um, so, as I think we've already seen this morning, we've done several research cruises throughout the, the entire German waters of the Baltic Sea and collected samples everywhere. And this shows a map of the dissolved TNT concentrations in bottom water. So the larger the symbol and the darker the red, the higher the, the concentration of TNT. Um, and as I think we've already heard, in virtually every sample, we find measurable levels of one explosive or another. Um, that is, of course, with the caveat that we're measuring this with a very sensitive instrument, so the concentrations are still very low. So this scale um, is going between 0 to about 10 nanograms per liter. And we find concentrations maybe up to 100, several hundred nanograms per liter. But now we can actually see plumes of dissolved explosives coming off of these munition dump sites. It's, it's very clear. And um, when we go into locations like Lubeck Bay or like Koberga Haida, then we can see very clearly this, this large signature, this release of, of dissolved explosives. Um, we also adapted our method to try and simplify it and make it easier to collect samples. So in this case, we use an infusion bag to gravity extract uh, the explosives from seawater. Um, and this 
method is so simple that we can actually uh, give this equipment to, to other colleagues, so people in, in the munition clearance industry or to uh, government monitoring agencies, and they can actually collect these samples for us, and we can bring them back to the lab and analyze them. Um, so these are data that we just got in April in collaboration with colleagues at the um, German Federal Maritime and Hydrographic Agency, the BSH. Um, and they had regular monitoring activities going on in the North Sea, and in the process of doing this regular monitoring, they also collected samples from munition compounds. And so here you can see the concentrations um, at, at some of those monitoring sites. And again, we see high concentrations or higher concentrations of dissolved TNT um, near some of these munition dump sites. In this case, in the North Sea, the concentrations of TNT are about a factor of 100 lower than we find in the Baltic Sea. So even lower concentrations, but we actually now have patterns that we can use to try and interpret and understand what's actually happening with the munitions and the release of these chemicals. <clears throat> um, in the same projects, when we've uh, done some of this field work to collect water samples, we've also done screening of various marine organisms. So this includes algae, a number of invertebrates, um, and so forth. Um, so in 2018, we collected nearly 200 organisms, and in more than 98% of those organisms, we measured one or more of these explosive compounds. So now it's very clear that not only are these explosive compounds coming out of the dump munitions, um, but the biota are being exposed and they're accumulating um, some of these, these chemicals. So um, that leads to sort of our conclusions and where we're at now. Um, so it seems clear that now we actually do have the capability to measure these compounds in seawater and I think that that this contamination should, um, should be monitored. Um, we don't right now have any baseline to understand whether conditions are changing or worsening. We don't really have any idea of whether climate change affects things like water temperature or increased storm frequency are having an effect on the release of these compounds. Um, and even though we're measuring very low concentrations of these compounds, the absolute concentrations may not be relevant from a, a public health risk um, perspective. Um, but if we can't actually see and understand how these compounds are behaving in the environment, um, then it's very difficult to develop risk assessments and to, to try and understand how we should prioritize cleanup and so forth. Um, we also see from a, a chemical oceanography point of view that there's a real clear need to develop metrologies for the analyses of these compounds. Um, these are not compounds that are frequently measured, and we need uh, to evaluate how accurate and precise our measurements are and how intercomparable are our results to other labs and people using other methods. Um, just as one example, this is a paper that uh, came out not long ago um, where the authors did exactly that, where they did a laboratory intercomparison, at least for marine biota tissue matrix. Um, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done on the analytical side to ensure that we have high-quality data that we can actually put into these risk assessments. Um, and just as a teaser, so um, some of our colleagues from the Explotech project will talk a little bit more about this in the technology session later today. Um, but we basically uh, uh, started this Explotech project, this uh, EU-funded project, um, as a follow-on to the method that we developed for measuring these compounds. Um, to try and develop a prototype system that we can actually take onto a ship and make these measurements at sea in near real time. Um, so here you see our, our very beautiful prototype. So this is actually a picture from the ship on Saturday. Um, we actually had it out at Colbert Haida making these measurements. So now we can actually measure these compounds on a ship and get data in near real time. So within 15 minutes we actually have data. And that data can then be used to guide at sea activities um, or for monitoring. We have another project that'll just be starting uh, this fall called Ammo Trace, where the goal is to develop other technology that can actually go under the water. Um, and so with that, I should thank all of the collaborators, all the people that contributed to the work that you see there, and then I'll hand it over to Anita Kunitsa. I don't know how they switch to the next one. But. Okay, but this looks good. 
Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. So I would like uh, to talk about the environmental impacts of munition in the marine environment. The green one, okay, good. Just to know which of the four buttons to press. <laughs> so, and this is the, uh, the structure of my presentation. Uh, first, I would like to talk about the hazard risks of munition, then the areas potentially contaminated by munition, then about mitigation of hazards caused by munition in the seas, um, then about the EU legal framework for protecting the marine ecosystem from hazardous substances. Um, then the quantification of explosive substances in the marine environment. And finally, the outlook. Uh, what kind of further research do we need? And what about implementation of measures? Um, so the, the hazard risks caused by munition, we can see from uh, this picture, these are hazard risks to ships, to fisheries, to constructions, human health and the marine ecosystem. This map you have seen in the one or other way today already, so it's a print screen from the Amokat database showing the German parts of the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. Uh, we distinguish between conventional munition and chemical weapons. Um, the conventional munition contains the explosive substances, TNT, RDX, HMX and others but also some heavy metals like mercury or lead. Um, in the German North Sea, we have 1.3 million tons of this conventional munition and in the Baltic Sea, only 300 tons. Um, when you look at these pictures, it looks as if there is much more munition in the Baltic Sea than in the North Sea. So that means at these little spots there in the North Sea, we must have a lot of munition. And the chemical weapons like Clark 1, 2, Adamsite, mustard gas, um, they occur in less amounts. So in the North Sea, we have only 90 tons near the island of Helgoland. And in the Baltic Sea, we have 5,000 tons, but it's much less than the conventional munition. And in order to compare this with all the other hazardous substances that we have in the North Sea and in the Baltic Sea and their inputs, I had a look at the uh, uh, pollution load compilation from Helcom. They compile all the inputs of hazardous substances into the Baltic Sea. And the highest amounts annually were from lead, that was 500 tons per year. So um, this is then 10 times less than the uh, chemical weapons in the Baltic Sea, just to give you an order of magnitude. So how do we uh, mitigate these different hazards? On the um, left-hand side, we have the endangered goods. Um, then in the middle, the hazard. And then to the right-hand side, we have the mitigations. I tried to give the complete picture. Parts of it we have here heard already today here. So endangered goods are, for example, ships, constructions, like platforms, cables, pipelines. Uh, the hazard is then the explosion, the uncontrolled detonation, and the mitigation actions are removal or controlled detonation or destruction. And this is uh, in Germany usually done in the coastal areas by the 
uh, explosive ordnance disposal service of the federal coastal states. And um, we have a, a guidance document um, which yeah, gives guidance how this could be or should be done. Then uh, for fisheries, we have the threat of chemical weapons in the nets. This is more a uh, Danish or uh, international problem around Bornholm less in German waters. Then for the marine ecosystem, we have two major threats. One is the underwater noise from the explosion, which hurts the, uh, yeah, the, the hearing of the marine mammals. So the mitigation action there is uh, bubble curtains um, who, yeah, who uh, um, take or reduce the, uh, the noise or explosion on land. With regard to hazardous substances which are leaking out of the uh, uh, munition or uh, yeah, leaking out due to Corrosion, or we heard also that um, explosion uh, underwater results in incomplete combustion, so it's freeing uh, the uh, toxic substances. And here uh, we recommend not to um, explode the munition underwater, but to remove it. Um, and the investigation of the hazard risks I will explain in the next slide. And finally, the, the human health um, is endangered by either white phosphorus, which um, looks like amber and is quite often mistaken by tourists for amber, and then uh, when it's heated or warmed, it starts burning and uh, you cannot extinguish it. So there the um, mitigation is warning signs at beaches, but the tourists have to read these warning signs. Or uh, the other hazard is the contamination of seafood. Eddie Maza has uh, talked about that. We have an EU regulation um, which is uh, regulating the maximum levels of contaminants in seafood, but um, TNT or other explosive substances are not yet regulated because uh, concentrations probably are still quite low. So the EU legal framework for protecting the marine environment for hazardous substances which are leaking from munition is, yeah, on the top it's the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. And this Marine Strategy Framework Directive has the major aim that the member states shall take the necessary measures to achieve or maintain good environmental status in the marine environment. The year has already passed. We haven't achieved this yet, but I would like to draw your attention to achieve or maintain good environmental status. That means the amount of hazardous substances in the marine environment should not increase. So we shouldn't have leakage from munition. And we have uh, in order to measure this, we have uh, three descriptors. Um, one is the concentration of contaminants uh, that should be at levels that are not giving rise to pollution effects. And the other one is uh, similar, but D9 is dealing with the seafood. So contaminants in fish and other seafood for human consumption do not exceed levels established by community legislation or other relevant standards. And the last descriptor, D11, is dealing with the underwater noise that should not adversely affect the marine environment. Um, so, in the coastal areas, 
12 nautical miles, the Water Framework Directive is the legal framework. Um, usually the Water Framework Directive is tackling only now one mi nautical mile, but for hazardous substances it's 12 nautical miles. And uh, this directive is saying that achieving concentrations in the marine environment close to zero for man-made synthetic substances, which are the explosives. So, um, under the Water Framework Directive, we have an, an Environmental Quality Standard Directive with a list of hazardous substances so-called priority substances and uh, further substances in the so-called watch list. And for these substances, um, environmental quality standards, some kind of limit values are being derived. And that is for concentrations of these substances in water, sediment and biota. And I would like to show you an example um, you cannot see the details, that doesn't matter. Every bar is one hazardous substance. And what is blue are concentrations, or they are the, uh, the monitoring stations with concentrations between, below the ecological quality standard, and red are those above the ecological quality standard. And when we have red monitoring stations, some action measures should be undertaken in order to have everything blue, so below the quality standard. Um, so we had thought at the German Environment Agency it would make sense to develop an ecological quality standard also for TBT, uh, TNT, 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 and that means that uh, toxicity data from laboratory tests are being used, their environmental properties are being used, check for carcinogeneity, mutageneity, persistence and bioaccumulation are being done. Um, not all published results are reliable. So um, the, the experts who have developed the, the technical guidance document, um, they have developed a methodology to check if a document is reliable, a test is reliable. Um, then there is a methodology how these ecological quality standards for sediment, water and biota are derived. Um, my colleagues are working on this. And uh, we plan to have a peer review by an expert network um, to compare these data with the monitoring data. And we might develop an indicator on TNT under the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. So I have to hurry up. I was told, OK. Um, with uh, the, um, Eddie Marza and his group, uh, we have a, a project um, to identify the concentrations of explosives in marine organisms in the German North Sea and Baltic Sea. This um, has four, um, yeah, to determine the uh, time trends, the spatial distribution, uh, to investigate the enrichment in the food chain and um, to check for chemical weapons. And uh, the results from the time trends where we used environmental specimen banking, which uh, my agency is doing for 30 years, so muscles are taken every year and defrozen for later analysis. And um, these um, monitoring stations are in the vicinity, about six kilometers from uh, dumped munition, and they show that in about the last 10 years, concentrations can be detected. They are still so low that they cannot be quantified, but they can be detected. Before, there was nothing in the samples. So from 30 years of sampling, only in the last 10 years something can be detected. And for us, this means, um, or is 
interpreted as a sign, can be interpreted as a sign that concentrations are increasing in the environment, which is not good. Um, so the, the outlook for further research and implementation of measures, we have a conference by environmental ministers in 2019. They took uh, some decisions, among others, um, they said that the screening for munition compounds should be done in the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. We are implementing this, so it should start next year. We have the CONMA project, which was mentioned here, research project, which should start in December this year um, for three years and should hopefully solve most of the remaining questions about concentrations in the environment. Um, we have a uh, marine strategy framework directive measure, which uh, we report to Brussels that we would like to remove the munition from the seafloor, that we would like to clean our national waters. Um, we have a federal state working group which is developing a, a guideline on how the munition should be cleared. This is my last slide. So <laughs> um, and we have an, an expert group on munitions in the sea, which is also very active in this meeting. Yeah, so my, uh, my conclusion here is um, we think that munition compounds will increasingly leak into the marine environment um, due to corrosion. So uh, we should avoid explosion of the munition. We should go for removing them from the seafloor and uh, we should probably start at the hotspots, uh, at the dump sites where we have high concentrations of munition. A test case should be done as soon as possible. The political parties have all said that they are willing to finance this. We will have elections later this month. Uh, and on Friday, there was uh, an online conference from NABU where all the uh, representatives from the various parties expressed their will that they will go for removal of these um, munition compounds. So we are really looking forward that something like that is going to happen. But it's not easy and um, it's involves a lot of activities from science, from the Navy, and can only be a joint effort, which needs to be coordinated by somebody. So, and with that, I would like to end my presentation. Thank you. <laughs> and next, next one is Jörn Schazak. Thank you. Yeah. The green one. <coughs> Okay, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. I'm a little bit in trouble because Anita has used half of my time and Eddie has already presented half of my data. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but there is a but, which is I have some slides in reserve, which touches another aspect which I originally did not want to talk about here today. So if that's okay with you, I will rush a little bit through my first slides and um, so to present you a few more aspects which are relevant in the fish context. Yeah? Okay, so I, will, I wanted to start off with the TNT, which was already mentioned by, uh, by Edmund Maza, and I would, wanted to talk about how fish are affected by the munition problem. And one issue or one aspect we always look at is the body condition body condition factor can be calculated by length, length by weight. It's uh, similar to the body mass index that we use in humans. And it tells, gives us a rough idea whether a fish is healthy, more healthy, less healthy, or sick. Yeah? Then, of course, we were interested in the questions, in the question, do 
fish have more or less diseases when they are exposed to uh, munition compounds. And um, here you see yeah, pictures that you have already seen today, the ba basic problem. Here the Kohlberger Heide again, not far away actually from, from the Kiel Bay, where we have this this open uh, TNT blocks, or I mean, it's not only TNT, and it's called Schießwolle in German. Uh, I don't know how to properly translate that. It's a mixture of different compounds, but TNT is one of the main compounds in there, and this is leaking into the environment. And we are collecting fish in the surrounding. Um, we are using a flatfish, the common depth. Uh, we collect it with, uh, with bottom uh, nets, with gill nets, and then we take the fish uh, on, on the ship, on the research ship, measure the length and the weight and look at diseases and uh, take samples for uh, TNT measurements. And this was actually mentioned, uh, the finding that in the bile, the bile extract from the extract from the liver, um, we find elevated uh, amounts of TNT. If you look at the graphs on the right-hand side, these are the values from the dump side. On the left-hand side, you see the values from, from the control side, and it's quite obvious that uh, the values here are increasing. But there is more information we can take from that because the liver is the main organ for detoxification in all vertebrates, including us, including fish. So the fish are uh, getting rid of the TNT, and you can probably not see it on the small screen, but the left bar in the dump site, this is TNT, the actual, the original TNT, which we did not detect in the bile, which, which means that either um, the fish just take up the degradation products or they degrade the TNT relatively fast into less toxic compounds um, the, for ADNT. Yeah? This is still toxic, so not healthy, but uh, it's a degradation process that, that is started in the liver of the fish and they excrete it. And um, this is now um, condition factors. Uh, the one with the red circle is fish from the Kohlberger Heide area. And you see that there is no difference to the other, to the control side. So we did not find an effect on the body condition. This is diseases, a list of different diseases, viral diseases, uh, per, uh, bacterial diseases, parasitic diseases, um, which are very similar if you start from the left to the right. On the right-hand side, you see then this, this uh, brown bar which is sticking out. This is again the Kohlberger Heide, and those are the fish which had liver nodules, which we call it in the first place. Um, so we can then look at these liver samples in more detail and confirm whether this is just a nodule or whether this is a, a, a cancer, a tumor. Yeah, uh, this is what you see on the uh, on the fish on the right hand side. This brownish area, uh, uh, this uh, um, light brown. This is the dissected out liver, and where you see the blood vessels. This is actually a tumor. It's huge in this in this case. And on the left hand side, you see the corresponding data. Um, the very left bars are the bars from the Kohlberger Heide, and you see that here the values are. Elevated, so in this area, fish have more tumors compared to other areas. So, if you put this together, um, we did not see any effects on the body condition. Um, but if we look at diseases, we find this elevated um, liver nodules or, or cancer, uh, liver cancer in the common depth. Yeah, we have, of course more questions I mean, we were just at the beginning. Some were already touched, for example, reproduction and reproduction of fish. So is this affected? This is something we actually don't know yet. Uh, for the food web, we also have very little information. How are the munition compounds uh, transferred into the food web and uh, do they reach uh, human nutrition? So um, the, the aspect of food safety is still uh, relevant and not very well um, addressed yet. This is a, a, man, a paper published by my, uh, my colleagues, and if you read the last sentence, there it says that uh, TNT was detected in the bile, but not in the fillet. And uh, Eddie referred to this result, so it's still safe to eat, to eat fish. Yeah? Um, I'm going to skip this one. I wanted to touch this aspect. This is the 
the extra round I'm going, I'm going to do with you. This is about uh, chemical warfare agents. And uh, on the lower left-hand side, you see the 5,000 tons value that uh, Anita mentioned previously. So this is what is in German waters. But there is much more, as you can see from the other uh, values. One famous area is the Bornholm Basin, where about 30,000 tons of um, chemical uh, weapons were dumped. And uh, together with colleagues to in investigated fish from that area. This is the red circle here with the B13. And there we looked at um, uh, cod, the Baltic cod. And in these graphs, it's probably difficult to see for you, but if you look at these red edges on the top of the graph, on the left-hand graph, this is uh, fish collected from the Bornholm dump site. And the red edges are con referring to arsenic, which was attributed to uh, chemical weapons. So this was measured in the fillet uh, of the fish and uh, it was present just above the detection limit, so in very tiny amounts. If you compare the right bar with the left bar, on the right bar you have 3%, on the left bar you have 14% where this uh, compound was detected. Um, so this is not like, it wouldn't, I would not say it's really indicating a huge danger for the, for the fish consumer, but it tells us that fish are taking up compounds also from, uh, from the chemical weapons. Here, these are other factors. This is, again, our condition factor. Um, the bars on the left-hand side are from, uh, from the Western Baltic Sea, where the cod have a higher condition factor. On the, on the right-hand side, we have the Eastern cod, where you have a lower uh, body condition uh, uh, Factors. And you see in the, with the red square that uh, there is also variation in the dump site, so there's also not a clear effect on body condition. Similar with uh, fish diseases, there was no significant effect on fish diseases that were, uh, if the fish were collected from the dump sites for chemical weapons. Okay, and now I'm going to jump back to this slide here to touch another aspect which is climate change. Aaron mentioned it. Um, this is a recent uh, paper that we, that we published. So this is actually an aspect which has not yet been addressed at all, so to say. We are just starting it to think about how temperature change, for example, influences uh, corrosion. And in this context, it would really be really very valuable to, get, to have more data and also to have models that allow us to estimate the development of this whole problem um, in the future with respect to the degradation of the munition, with respect to uh, substances that are uh, released with potential respect to effects on the uh, biota. Okay, thank you very much. Ah, hmm? oh, yeah, sorry. I now hand over to our vi virtual colleague. Are you there? Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. Um, I will try to share my screen. However, I think I'm not allowed to um, because I'm not the host. So I don't know if someone can put my slides up. I can otherwise just speak through what I have. Okay. Try it. Okay, let me see. If I can't, then I will just... Well, it looks like I might be able to. Let's see. Take just a moment. Okay, hopefully you're able to see that. Good. Great. So my name is Kendra, and I am... Um, I work with Norwegian People's Aid as a senior advisor on environment. Let me just tell you briefly what Norwegian People's Aid is and does, because we are a little bit different than the other um, fine panelists today. So we are a humanitarian mine action operator, and we have been operating since 1992 in um, removing explosives. So we clear landmines and explosive remnants of war. And we currently work um, on this in over 20 countries, uh, basically all over the world, including in Eastern Europe. 
We have now a green demining focus where we are actively mainstreaming environmental safeguarding into our mine action operations and where we're trying to better understand the impact of explosive remnants of war on the environment, the physical environment. So one area in which we operate, um, so this will take you to a different um, corner of the globe, is the South Pacific, um, and specifically in the Solomon Islands and Palau. Um, and in these areas, as probably many people are aware, there's very heavy uh, explosive remnants of war contamination in the sea, in coastal areas, and of course on land. And this is a legacy uh, problem, uh, largely from World War II. Now, despite the fact that this is an old problem uh, in terms of time and history, we still lack very good um, and reliable estimates of the extent of this contamination and also its location. So one thing that we do is trying to survey and map um, exactly these two problems, the extent and the location of contamination. So in the um, absence of very good, reliable estimates and evidence um, on the extent and location, we do, however, know that explosive remnants of war is a daily presence in people's lives, and it does impact on the lives of individuals and communities in these areas. And of course, this includes um, death and bodily injury and harm, which of course has health effects. Um, but also we know um, more anecdotally um, that there is and has been contamination of land and crops, contamination of water and marine resources. Now, more research needs to be done on the extent of this to which um, the former panelists have um, also uh, touched on. And one thing that I want to talk about today, so in terms of why this uh, matters, is that um, it has an effect on human behavior, um, contamination. And one problem that we have or challenge that we have come across in our operations is that local communities are using the explosives they find to conduct what's called blast fishing or dynamite fishing. So um, this is the use of explosives at sea to stun or kill fish. And um, individuals and communities in the <clears throat> South Pacific find abandoned, abandoned munitions um, in land and at sea. And they take these and then use them, as you saw in the photo before, to um, blast fish, literally. Now, we don't have, again, very good evidence um, about the extent of this problem or its scale, but um, some kind of preliminary evidence that um, we and others have collected indicate that at least there are several hundred fishermen in the Solomon Islands that appear to be involved with this practice. Now, this practice is often illegal in most places, including in these island states, because it is so destructive. But its enforcement is quite difficult because of geography and low capacity. So the Solomon Islands, for instance, is hundreds of islands, many of which are extremely remote. Uh, and the Solomon Islands is also a rather poor country, so it's difficult to enforce all of these laws. Um, SDG, so Sustainable Development Goal number 14, calls for an end to this practice specifically. They call it destructive uh, fishing. And it is a prevalent uh, practice elsewhere, including in Libya, which of course has been affected by armed conflict and where there are explosive remnants of war as well. Okay, why should we care about blast fishing? Well, it has a number of impacts. Um, uh, so it is often seen as being easier and cheaper um, to sustainable fishing practices, which it may be in the short term. However, of course, it's extremely risky um, in terms of the fact that people can die from this practice and have died and be injured. Um, there is some evidence to indicate that it does contaminate fish. Again, the evidence here is not very robust, so it would be very useful to have more research on this and to know the extent of the contamination and, as the former um, speaker um, discussed, exactly what kind of health impacts that might have in terms of um, entry of contaminants into the food supply. 
it does, this practice does kill species, uh, fish species indiscriminately. And so it becomes very wasteful um, and depletes fish stocks. So it does contribute to what's called illegal, um, it's basically illegal and underreported fishing and to stock depletion. And in terms of um, economics, it does reduce the market price for fish. And this ultimately um, reduces everybody's income and harms livelihoods. And it ultimately worsens poverty and makes this an evil cycle. And then from a more uh, biological perspective, and maybe again picking up on the previous panelists' um, plea for more research on climate change, so we do know that this practice of blast fishing does damage coral reefs which then leads to biodiversity dead zones and can impact the ability of coral reefs to act as a wave buffer, which is going to be a problem in island states, low-lying island states, if we have the rise in uh, sea levels that are predicted um, in the latest um, IPCC climate change reports. Okay. To conclude, um, so there are some prevention measures. We do have regulations, as I mentioned before, uh, blast fishing is often illegal. Um, and there are some uh, monitoring and enforcement measures, um, for instance, shot spotter, which is a way of detecting when explosives um, go off and then um, well, this organization goes out to investigate and hopefully catch the people that are responsible. Um, we do have some evidence that community involvement in monitoring and enforcement um, of regulations does work to uh, reduce this problem. Um, so cooperation with local communities is really important both to ex identify the extent of the problem and then also um, stop it. Um, we also know that education and awareness raising is important, and there are some initiatives afoot to, to do that, and training in sustainable fishing practices. And lastly, um, helping people to find and provide alternative livelihoods is, of course, very important, and tourism can be an important deterrent. And that's it from me, so thank you very much. Thank you, Kendra Dupoy, very much. Um, I hope you can hear us okay in this room. Can you hear us, Kendra? Well, I we'll, can. Okay, that's great. I just want to make sure before we, uh, you know, bring you in on on this conversation that we're about to have, um, because it's important that I that we get input from all of you, of course. And uh, I want to begin by talking by asking you about where we are now relative to where we were say 10 years ago in terms of understanding the impacts of unexploded munitions and, and chemical uh, warfare agents in the sea. Uh, it's, you know, we heard earlier this morning uh, suggestions that in 2003, there, we, there were, in some cases, we weren't even aware that this was a problem. And now uh, there seems to be growing, much growing, greater growing awareness. I would like to know where we are now relative to 10 years ago and what's driving this, uh, our understanding of it. So let's start here in, in the room, perhaps. Uh, you'd like to begin, Aaron? Yeah, sure. Um, so I only came into this about six years ago, so my perspective doesn't go back a whole lot farther than that. Okay. But I think in the past five or six years, um, there have been a number of major research projects that have greatly advanced things, and those have also brought about a lot of publicity, and so there's a lot of public interest and a lot of political interest in the problem. Um, and I think that visibility has really advanced um, a lot of the sort of momentum that, that we have now. Um, and what do you see that we've learned that is you know, of great significance for this that uh, compared to what we didn't know? Because I was just actually, not, not 2003, but 2013, I think, that Catherine Warner this morning was uh, noting in her presentation that dumped chemical warfare agents to the sea were not considered to be a problem just uh, you know, back in 2013, which is rather remarkable because to me, as a, a lay person, uh, chemical agents that are meant to hurt and kill people, uh, if you put them in the water, that doesn't mean they're they're gone. Uh, so I'm just wondering what, what it is, what we have gathered in these past few years that you've been researching, for example, that is of significance in terms of our understanding impact. Where do you see that uh, happening most? 
Oh, um, I mean, w one clear example is we keep talking about Kolberga Haida, which is this ma major dump site where now we see the contaminants coming out and getting into organisms and so forth. Five, six years ago, we had no idea what even was on the, the seafloor. And so now we have clear maps of everything that lays down there. Jens has these beautiful images of all of the munitions that lay there. We have clear measurements of the stuff that's coming out. We have clear understanding of at least some of the impacts. Um, and some idea of now what to do next. I mean, it's a completely different picture than where we were six years ago. So even that's, that's just within the past six years. And Anita, you've been working on in this topic for a long time. Uh, you've seen developments progress uh, significantly. What do you see as the most significant developments in, say, the past 10 years or so since you've been looking at this uh, issue on the impact side, how, how munitions are impacting uh, ecosystems and, and perhaps uh, humans as well? Yeah, like in the in the 90s, we have discussed this topic of munitions in the sea, and the the common opinion was that it's safer to leave it where it is, because we also we didn't know how to handle the problem. Like chemical munitions, you cannot transport that over land and to a combustion place. It's too risky. Uh, too dangerous, so the, the opinion at that time was just leave it where it is. There's uh, hydro, what is it called? Hydrolysis. Hydrolysis. So it would dissolve itself. Um, and nowadays we know the, the stuff is still there and we have also all this conventional munition. And uh, the shells, the metal is corroding and it's leaking into the environment. Uh, it's not so easy to measure TBT, but we have now the possibility to, to measure it in water, sediment and biota. We are able to detect it. The, the, the scientists were able to lower the detection limit. So before, people could measure it in a milligram. Uh, amount, now it's mic microgram, right. nanogram, so much, much lower concentrations. And we see it's there, it's, it's everywhere. And it's also, we could, we could wait and uh, wait until the concentrations have increased and we have then these environmental quality standards and they are not reached yet but we have to have the precautionary principle in mind. Sure. And the, the metal is corroding, and right. at a certain time it cannot be taken out safely anymore. Right. So we therefore we should, we should act now. Exactly. We, we will be talking about uh, mitigation tomorrow. We have a, a, a separate session devoted to that, and I'm really looking forward to that. Of course, that's very much connected. The action is very much connected to the knowledge. But uh, right now, when we talk about the impacts of trying to actually understand how these munitions are impacting our environment and uh, societies, too, um, is it because we're our measuring instruments are, have become more sensitive? Are we spending more time actually looking at it? Or is this a problem that was there all along, but we're only now beginning to become more conscious of it because we're looking at it? And corrosion, of course, is contributing. What do, what do you see as being the most significant insights that have come out yeah. uh, through our work? I think uh, the most significant was to be able to detect the leakage. To, to detect, to detect leakage. leakage that to really detect that substances are coming out from this dump munitions. I mean, until the 19th, everybody thought this is covered uh, uh, and nothing is going to happen to it. It's not going to change. But now we see that substances, which are obviously toxic, are leaking out uh, from from these uh, dump munitions, and they are spreading, and the environment are in control. That um, they are. That we find it in fish. We find it in other biota. Um, it's just a matter, a matter of time until yeah we have it on our plate, so to say. Yeah. So I think this was the the breakthrough that uh, really it's kind of creeping out from uh, from these munition dumps. Yeah. K Kendra, you've also been working in this area for a long time. Has has your uh, perception of the impact changed, or you, you described some very, very real impacts of, uh, 
you know, uh, mm. well, I mean, of course, you know, all impacts are real, but the idea of actually taking the munitions and re repurposing them and using them to, to for fishing and to blast fish and what I mean, that's uh, that obviously has been around, I guess, as long as the people have been finding the munitions. But what what have you seen change in the last you know, years while you've been working on this subject in terms of our perception of the impact? Yeah, thanks a lot, Terry. So um, you're right that this um, is an old problem, blast fishing. It's not new, and neither are sea munitions. But I think what we have seen a change in is not only an improvement in scientific methods, as our former panelists just alluded to, but also there is now really um, a lot more attention to the environmental impact of armed conflicts. Um, there is a lot more attention to um, climate change and the importance of oceans, um, both in climate change and in mitigating climate change. And then we also have um, new methods for um, kind of broadly speaking, addressing the problem of sea munitions. So it's a mixture of the scientific front and also um, the policy front and what's um, in awareness of the problem, specifically in terms of, of conflict. I'm going to bring, start bringing in questions from the room uh, very quickly. I'm just going to put one of my own questions to the, to the panelists first and then also people online uh, because we're monitoring those online questions as well and we want to, to get that as well. So if you have, some, have a question, you can maybe start making your way towards the, the microphone. Um, but before we get to that, I want to raise a point that was mentioned this morning by uh, Fabrizio Constantino in his presentation, and this is the EU trying to get an assessment of, of where things are uh, in this, in this, on this topic. Uh, in his conclusions, he said there's a lack of consensus on methodology regarding data collection on environmental impacts. Uh, I found that interesting because if, you, if you're not you know, agreed on how you measure these things, then it's going to be difficult to come up with actionable policies uh, based on that. I'm just wondering to whether you agree with that assessment, and if so, to how much of a problem you think that is. Let's uh, just whoever wants to go first on that. I see you nodding, Aaron. I mean, I, you, you want to jump on it. Let's let's hear it. Oh, I think I think it's a, a common problem with a lot of these these kind of um, interpretation-based uh, things. I don't typically work with impact, so we're interested in what is the biogeochemistry of these compounds in the environment. Um, so uh, it's probably better answered by people who actually work on the impact side of things. I mean, yeah, we would. We would need to search for tools that allow us some kind of standardization, standardized methods that allow us a kind of a biological monitoring, yeah, uh, which are ideally relatively simple to apply and which can be uh, performed by different labs on the same qu on a comparable quality level. Now, if you ask me now, what would this be? Difficult, difficult it's question. I could say fish diseases, but as you have seen, um, only the, the tumor aspect was really relevant in the end. Um, maybe we should also look at other species. Maybe the muscle is, is, is a better. Or what came to me during my last cruise was crustaceans, crabs, so uh, Carcinus minas, Strandkrabbe, because it was attacking our fish. Yeah, and when we took up the, the nets with the fish, we had a lot of crabs there. So with these crabs, they live right next to the munition. And uh, it would be easy to catch them with basket. Mm. You just need a basket with some, some dead fish material mm. in there, and you'll have loads of crabs straight from the uh, munition dump site. I mean, this is just an idea. Maybe something we can evaluate further with, uh, with the CONMA uh, project. But we need, um, it would be ideal to have a tool like that. Yeah. Well, what, what I find very interesting about the discussions we're having here uh, is that the, the metrics that are being developed, you know, I can see that there, there's a lot of innovation going on in terms of how to actually measure what's happening. And uh, you know, the, the idea that there's no consensus yet on how to go about measuring suggests that uh, there's, it's going to take a while before, we, uh, before there's going to be f agreement on how, 
how you can develop a set of metrics over time in order to then determine what should be done. But anyway, these are, I suppose, still, still early days, but a, a lot more seems to be known now than we knew, uh, say, 10, 15, 20 years ago about a subject that's been around for a long time. I mean, let's, you know, we're talking about munitions from the Second World War, sometimes the First World War uh, in some cases, uh, and of course, uh, chemical weapons as well. So we've got a couple of people already lined up at the microphone. Uh, so let's uh, begin. If you'd please just identify yourself and uh, and direct your question. Try try to keep it uh, succinct. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Paula Vanninen. I'm a professor at the University of Helsinki, Verifin, and we have been working since 2005 in the developing methods for sediment samples and currently for the biota samples. And together with the colleagues here also on the stage. And I would say that how I see that why the interest is at the moment is poorly or basically totally economical. It's not about uh, researchers are, have been all the time very much worried about environment. But the common public, it's not. And uh, this is rude to say, but I have seen that when we have been able to analyze sediment samples, for example, it has been companies who built pipelines or now the windmill parks are, are to be built. So this is a promoting. I'm very happy about this development. Basically, what you, everybody says that we are like in a status quo in the research. Much more needs to be done, and I really hope that some big steps are done after this meeting to okay. figure out how we can really make the research and that we can compare data and so like already stated. Thank you very much. That's, uh, that's uh, in words of encouragement uh, to, to continue. Um, I recall when I was doing my own preparations for this, uh, a, talking about impacts um, and talking about building pipelines or wind parks, uh, which is part of this, of course, the, uh, there was a bridge that Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister of the UK, wanted to build uh, linking different parts of Britain. And uh, they, did a, they did a feasibility study and saw it's, there's just too much, there are too many unexploded ordnance bits down in the water to make that a viable concept. I mean, these, these are also, these are, this isn't, you can call it an economic impact, but it's also a real world infrastructure issue. And it's affecting a lot of things. The impacts are, are real in, in that respect too. So I'm hoping that during this conference, we'll hear more uh, about these, these sorts of impacts as well, projects that are being stopped, which affects people's lives. Um, anyway, okay, so yes, sir. Uh, Please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. My name is Sven Kuszynski. I'm a consultant on marine um, nature conservation. And I have two questions, one general and a very specific one. The general question is the focus uh, is quite a lot on TNT and its degradation products. But we learned that uh, other um, explosives are in the mixture of Schieswolle, for example. Uh, why is that? Is it easier to detect with the methods we have at hand? Or is it that uh, the, uh, the expectation is that this is the main uh, compound which causes most problems? And the specific question to Jörn Scharzak is you mentioned that the uh, TNT or ADNT is in the uh, bile of the DAP. Uh, which you analyzed, and uh, that is being excreted, which is good for the fish, but that doesn't come without costs, I assume. You, you would assume metabolic costs, uh, which might also act on the reproduction ability. Can you s speculate a bit on this? Thanks. Should I so try? Those are two questions. Uh, uh, were they, sorry, that, the, that one was directed to you. Was the first one directed to you as well? I'm sorry. I would go for the second one. Okay. I, I can answer the, the okay. first one. Okay, great. All right. Yeah. Great. So um, TNT and its metabolites are more toxic than the other. Uh, so I shouldn't say more toxic. They are also carcinogenic and mutagenic. And that's the most important thing. So they are more dangerous than the other ones. And uh, also TNT has been... Um, analyzed and evaluated already a lot in the 17th, and there is also a REACH dossier 
on TNT. So, and in a REACH dossier, you know, REACH is the um, is dealing with all the industrial chemicals, and this REACH dossier is combining all the information that is available on TNT. So that makes it easy to start with TNT. So on the one hand, TNT is carcinogenic, mutagenic, therefore it's the most dangerous one, and we have also most of the information on it. But in the CONMA project, we try to get also information on the other substances. So we will do toxicity tests also on the other substances and develop also environmental quality objectives also for the other substances. Carcinogenicity is uh, more relative or more relevant for long-lived species such as humans. And this might not be true for the other uh, species which we need to look at, which are short-lived, like worms or crabs or s even some fish. Okay, Th thank you very much okay. for your, for your uh, question and your questions and your comment. Um, uh, Jan, would you like to yeah, address that? I mean, this um, metabolic transformation of, or this detoxification process definitely costs energy. So the fish will lose energy while it's detoxifying uh, itself, yeah? If it, this has a direct impact on its reproductive capacity, I cannot really tell you at the moment. Um, but this is a very interesting aspect. It's an important aspect. Um, I think what we maybe can contribute to to address this point is that we also uh, that we look more at the gonads, the, the gonad development of the fish. There is. Uh, also a very simple factor, like the condition factor, you simply weigh the gonads in re ratio to the body weight. And uh, if a, a fish uh, cannot use all its energy for the gonad production, um, then the gonads should be relatively smaller in respect to the, uh, to the body. So this is an, an important aspect. I hope we can include this in, in future samplings. Thank you. Um, any, I don't see anyone else standing up at the, the microphone at this point. Are there any online questions? Okay, we, we, we do have someone racing to the microphone. <laughs> so if, if, I, if I can just throw something sure. in before, uh, before Eddie gets up there, Sven, to your, to your earlier question. So we actually do measure a bunch of different explosives. So we don't just measure TNT. I think TNT was the most abundant explosive used. Um, RDX is also quite abundant. Um, uh, we find that everywhere. One of the interesting things that we found is dinitrobenzene. So this is also... Uh, explosive that's used in some of these explosive mixtures. And we find in certain locations that that is the dominant uh, explosive that we find. So in Lubeck, for example, we find 10 to 100 times higher dinitrobenzene than TNT. Um, there's been, as far as I can tell, no research done on the toxicity of dinitrobenzene. I can't find anything with regard to that. Um, and it's one of the things I think that might be kind of a disconnect between the historical information about what's present, where it's present, and what are the important toxicants in different locations. So, so. so we should take this up in the CONMA project. Yeah, so it's, it's something for the future, but this is one of the yeah. things that we learned by doing some of these, these surveys. Okay, my name is Edmund Meza. I was there in the first session. Um, I want to, uh, to give a comment on the TNT and the ADNT uh, metabolites. So uh, it's a matter of question if these metabolites are more toxic or more carcinogenic than the TNT uh, it, itself. So when we uh, just um, look at the concentrations in the water, we find TNT but less ADNTs. And when we look in the sediment, we also find a TNT and less ADNTs. But when we look in the biota, we find more ADNTs than the TNT. And that tells us that the metabolic transformation takes place in, within the biota. And when uh, you look in the literature, then you find that the transformation from TNT to the metabolites, this is the way the toxicity is derived from. Because the electrons are setting free, they cause oxidative stress, so I could go more into the detail, but just to, 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 to uh, make it clear, the transformation from TNT to ADNT causes the toxicity. And when you measured in the muscles or in the fish, the ADNT, it was originally the TNT. So making toxicological risk assessments, you should combine both the TNT, the ADNTs, and then start with the sum of all these compounds and make then the risk assessment. This, this chemistry, of course, all this chemistry is extremely important in understanding impact. It's all about 
actually detecting it and, and uh, documenting it uh, in order to then understand and, you know, what should be done. I think I see it, another gentleman approaching. Yeah. And if there are online, excuse me, just if there are online questions, um, first of all, we have another person to not neglect the people, the hundreds of people who have joined this conference online. So uh, if I see our rapporteur back there who's following all of this, if there's uh, input that we, oh, you do have, okay, absolutely, good. Then uh, we'll take one more question from in the room and then we'll go to our online audience. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My name is Uwe Wichert. I'm the head of the research team from the expert group. Uh, we read and we speak about 1. million tons of ammunition at sea. That is a very, very real number and fixture. Because why? Uh, the German Air Force has on the 1st April in 45 a stock of 480,000 tons of conventional ammunition. That it's a mighty point, it's only the Air Force. And all the other ammunition from the Navy, from the Army, from the Waffen SS, from the Volkssturm was added. We work on the number and we see the 1.6 million, it's a very, very correct number. And we must do all and collect and concentrate all our knowledge and experience <coughs> to reduce the risk at sea. Thank you. Thank you, because there, this uh, measuring, again, measuring what's there and how much of a problem it is, uh, that's extremely important for developing uh, uh, an approach for, for addressing it. So we're going to now bring in some questions that are coming up. No. Oh, I see. Okay. That was a, that was a no. I wasn't <laughs> sure whether that was a, a nod yes or no. Okay. So we don't have any questions coming here uh, on, on that impact. But for me, uh, so this is great for me because I'm, I'm a journalist and I love asking questions, even though my questions are probably not going to be uh, dealing with chemistry and how you, how you get, develop those sorts of metrics. But uh, when this does, when this story does make it into the, your television, evening television news program, it's because of some sort of problem that has made it up in the, in the news chain, to, which is very difficult to do. Um, the idea of a threat, you know, what sort of threat is posed by munitions in the sea? When we're talking impact, we're talking risk and, and threat. So we heard again in the presentation from the EU research project this morning, and those conclusions are going to be, I think, significant in the EU policy community. There was the statement in the conclusions that explosive, uh, or whether unexploded ordnance was deemed to pose the biggest threat as opposed to what? I don't know. I suppose chemical weapons agents? I don't know. There seems to be some debate about whether chemical weapons agents, which, are, which predominate in the Baltic Sea, uh, are of greater threat, uh, may have a greater impact than, than unexploded ordnance, than conventional weapons. Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I have a thought. Um, so uh, I'm uh, sort of a marine chemist, and so from my perspective, uh, munitions on the other hand, munitions are a chemical threat and one which I think is actually manageable. Um, these are point source emissions from a point source that not only can it be cleaned up, but it is actively cleaned up by all of the, the players who are going to talk later in the week about remediation. Um, th these are things we have colleagues who do this every day. So it's a problem which is actually um, I think, accessible. We, it's a problem that can be solved. Um, it's not like mercury, which is globally distributed and uh, is very difficult to grasp. Kendra, I'm, I'm still aware that you're, you're with us. Uh, we haven't forgotten you, of course. I, I know that you, you're dealing with uh, you know, things ex exploding in different parts of the world. I mean, what do you see as the, as the most significant human impact of unexploded ordnance and chemical weapons that have been dumped in the sea? Boy, uh, where to start? Thank you very much. Um, obviously, on human health, um, obviously, explosive remnants of war kill people. They um, injure people. So we know from in terms of an anthropocentric perspective that they do impact on human health, on human livelihoods, um, economics, all societies. Um, Which not also, much has been you know, talked about we, here, the economic aspects of it at yeah. all so far. So, well, I mean, if you think, um, yeah. No, you're right. So um, in terms of the Solomon Islands example, 
which I can go back to. So we know that, for instance, uh, when people um, use explosives to conduct blast fishing, that they then glut the market with a lot of fish and that has an economic impact. Um, also, death and injury has an economic impact. It reduces human capital. So, um, of course, you know, the environmental impacts, human impacts, you can't, um, you can't divorce these things because people are interacting in the physical environments and changing and altering the physical environment. So, um, I don't think there's any one, well, I'm sure you could rank the problems, but um, many of these are really interlinked. Um, and so, you know, looking at the social effects, the, the economic effects, the health effects, yeah, there's, there's many of them. So, yeah. Um, when we when we look at munitions in the sea right now, I mean, there's a lot of talk about it. We've been trying to measure it. How much is there? How fast is it degrading? What what uh, what is it doing to the fish populations? Is that a problem? At what point does it become a problem for human consumption when we're when we're eating eating products from the sea? Um, and we're making lots of progress in trying to figure that out. But when we you know when in terms of infrastructure, when it comes to wind parks, I mean, let's be honest with ourselves. A lot of this discussion is coming from, uh, from pressure from wind parks. We're now saying, oh, we need to make an energy transition, and so let's, and there's only so much space available on land, so let's put up more wind parks on the ocean. And what is down there? Well, there's a lot of unexploded ammunition. We need to do something about that. Just wondering if that's even on anybody's radar here in terms of, of do you see this driving this, this discussion at all? Is this a factor, or, or am, I, am, I, am I making this up? No, no, I think it's, it's a factor. And it's in the discussions you hear presentations from those who clean the, the floor for the offshore wind parks. But I mean, if I compare it on land, if a house, uh, a building is being built, uh, there needs to be a check if there are bombs. And then if there is a bomb, it will be removed. So we hear that in the news every week, that somewhere is an evacuation is going on because a bomb is uh, being removed. Mm. And the same we have, we now start uh, building into the sea. We have just in, in Germany, we had just the agreement on the, uh, how is it in English, Raumordnungsplan, so the, um, the, the plan. <laughs> <laughs> where where to uh, to build what or how to use sure. the it's sea and zoning, the North yeah. Sea? Uh, a huge amount of space is needed for the offshore wind farms because else we don't get enough renewable energy. So we have these conflicts with nature protection and protection of birds in the sea that uh, mm -hmm. disappear if we build the wind parks. Um, so we had heated debates, but we are going to build all these offshore wind farms. And yes, the, the ground needs to be cleared before this construction can be made. Okay. So <laughs> uh, right. Anyway, okay. That was just uh, maybe fishing in, a, in troubled waters, as it were. Uh, it looks like we do have something coming from, from our online community. Yes, uh, and I think you answered parts of the question, but there might be a hidden point, uh, for example, for Jan, um, for Jan Schazak, uh, which kind of social impacts are the most relevant, which is slightly different from uh, the most, whatever is mo most serious, to human society, likely, uh, like, uh, for example, the Boris Johnson Bridge, which is an economic impact, I think, but uh, what's the most relevant one? Uh, compared to Solomon Islands, we might find uh, an example for all the different water bodies on the globe. Mm. I'm tempted to say tourism. If this is, <laughs> I mean, this is not only social, it's also like very much commercial. Um, but I think this is, an, is a very important aspect all around the Baltic at yeah, basically every coast that we have. Um, so do people like to swim, being aware that they might swim across uh, dumped munitions. I mean, this is a, a, a problem. Maybe one of the biggest 
social problems right now. Not sure, maybe you have other ideas. So, okay, um, right. The, I mean, for me, we only have a few minutes left. We have, we have exactly uh, well, about five minutes left on, on this. So uh, maybe, if, there's any, if anyone else has, has any points that they want to make, this would be the time to make them. But I'm, you know, I'm almost feeling a sense of frustration here on, on my side. I'm trying to wrap my, my, my mind around you know, what are the impacts that are really driving this, uh, this discussion right now. Because uh, this conference is testament to the fact that there is, there is momentum gathering in this will to finally do something about uh, munitions that are they're eroding and it's based on our awareness of their potential dangers and their, their their current dangers so when i'm looking at potential impacts of is it then human health is it the food web is it infrastructure you know is it all these things together do you have any way of prioritizing these so it can kind of begin to put them together in a clearer picture that would be my final my final question and it looks like we do have another another question coming from the audience so i would just make a short uh, comment to that and i think where we're coming from is the recognition that there's a problem that we don't fully understand and we're trying to learn more about it to understand the scope of the problem and how serious it is um, on the other side i think really the only uh, action that's right now actively being taken is an economic one. It's there are companies that are installing cables and wind parks, and they're willing to pay enormous amounts of money to clear the the land and and install that infrastructure. It's a blue economy problem that is actually driving the clearance of the munitions to this point. Um, that, that's I appreciate my perspective. your candor yeah. on that. Yeah. And then as, yeah. Yeah. As the next, I would see uh, the health issue, the human health issue or environmental health, human health issue. No? Yeah. I mean, at the moment, uh, I think it's still safe to go swimming, it's still safe to eat fish, and so on. But um, I do hard to predict that this will be the case in 10 years or 20 years if we do not really uh, start now taking action. This would also be my point. I mean, I have shown this slide with all the, uh, the goods and the hazards. So for ship safety, we have good measures. So this is well established, it's no problem. For the construction, I mean, it costs money, but um, yeah, that's it. We, we, when we use electricity, we will all pay for this, uh, that all the OXO had to be removed, but that's, that's it. Also for decommissioning of oil platforms, we are discussing this. Then again, a check needs to be ma if there is munition around so that these operations can be done. But the new thing is that this uh, toxic stuff is leaking into the environment. We have heard a train from Paris to Moscow. This <laughs> is quite a big amount. I try yeah. to show also how much lead or other substances mm -hmm. are entering the marine environment. <coughs> There we can have measures at the input side, but this is waste at the sea, okay. historic waste, and I think we have to remove it, and the sooner the better. We, we sure. shouldn't wait 100 years. I, th I think you've got a lot of people on your side there. Um, yes, sir. Okay, I mean, we, we can keep this short, and actually, when I got, after I got up, most the point is already a, has been addressed, and that is really tourism. Uh, you mentioned uh, wind farms as being maybe an economic push um, towards addressing the munition problem, but yeah, actually, tourism is the number one uh, blue economic sector uh, in terms of employment, so it, it is really uh, powerful. So I, my question is, and I'm really ignorant about that, is it a concern? I mean, uh, are there examples where tourism is affected by munition already, or is that just a prospect that might happen in the future or not? Mm -hmm. So is, is, it, is it a valid, valid argument um, to say, so if you want to keep our tourism um, sector booming or so, um, it, it, this is also connected to a healthy uh, seafloor uh, or clean seafloor in terms of munition? Extremely important for coastal communities, of course, you know, for fishing yeah. too, but uh, tourism very much so, and it's hard to imagine what Mecklenburg Vorpommern would do uh, if it's if suddenly you couldn't go to the coast there anymore. 
Uh, yeah, so we know about white phosphor washing up. Perhaps anyone, anyone would anyone like to comment on, on that? Yes, we had uh, a thriller in TV just a few days ago about the island of Usedom. And this was about white phosphorus. A girl was playing and then somebody uh, burned her hands and uh, died. So it's, it's being used in TV and died. And died yeah. Not of the phosphorus, but because of a shock and oh, okay. fell, and so. But that that was the thriller story. But by this, people are aware that there is white phosphorus, and there are all these signs at the beaches. But yeah, still, still accidents are happening. It's a so. it's a very real it's a very real impact example, and a good way uh, to conclude. I think this session today. Um, we are now officially over time. So I'll, I'll thank all, all four of our, our panelists, uh, those with us here and, and of course, uh, joining us virtually. And thank you all for being with us here in, in the room. We're going to have a, a coffee break right now. Um, but first, I would like to give a warm round of applause for our, our panelists. <laughs> well done. The, um, just to give you an idea of what's coming up, uh, we, we're going to take a coffee break right now. I'm sure you're all very happy about that. We have just a half an hour of, of coffee break. Coming up after that, we've got a, a cabinet key level, uh, cabinet level keynote from the government of Schleswig-Holstein, uh, and we have a session on legal aspects, which I'm, I know this interests a few people in this room too. So thank you very much, and see you thank in you. half an hour. <laughs>